Uh, I spoke yesterday about how I had um, tried to uh, mainstream myself in a way by going through the Kennedy School of Government, by trying to get a job inside the government at the FDA. Um, the, the sort of maximum reach for that was that uh, the CIA came recruiting to the Kennedy School and I thought if they had the audacity to come recruit, I would have the audacity to apply. And so I thought, what would I want to do for the CIA if I were to? And I thought, what uh, ideal location to do a study on the national security implications of legalizing drugs? Because the CIA really does keep track of which groups around the country are, and around the world are selling drugs. And we know that the CIA has made alliances with various uh, groups like the Northern Alliance that helped us in Afghanistan that, that raised a lot of their money from opium sales. So uh, this was around the time of the Iran-Contra as well, shortly after that. And so I thought I would um, see if I could work inside the CAA to try to understand really what are the national security implications of legalizing drugs. And I, I made a pretty good presentation about why I should be hired. Um, and and the, they were very interested. I, I had started... Um, my parents had sent me to Russia uh, when I was 16 years old. To study, Ru I was studying Russian in high school, and they gave me some books to give to the guys at the, the old guys at the synagogue. So I kind of started my underground career in Russia, which was uh, of interest to the guys at the CIA. Uh, I had some really radical right-wing relatives in Israel that were part of the underground there. That spent a bunch of time in jail. That fought against the British and. So uh, it turned out this guy I was talking to was also assigned to Israel. And so he knew some of the, we had common friends. And, but he said that there's really, um, you can't tell us what you want to do. And we're not interested in looking at the national security implications of legalizing drugs. And I was like, don't you guys do war games about all these different kind of things that here's a national security issue? And he said, we're just not looking at it. And then about six years later, this was right around the time of the fall of communism, the biggest area at the CIA of employment increase was in their counter-narcotics division, up to around 150 people or so. And the head of that came back to the Kennedy School. And I asked him, um, you know, I told him about how I had applied. I wanted to do this research. And I said, all these years later, you got all these people. Have anybody actually looked at this? And he said, no, we're not allowed to look at that. So there's just this incredible resistance to even conceiving of the alternative. But I think that's really changing. And I think that has to change as we try to talk about how um, we can integrate psychedelics into society, how we can get some of the most benefits from it. It will require this larger drug policy transformation. Um, Alex also talked a little bit about NIDA and the fact that they do fund a billion dollars worth of research. Um, NIDA actually has a monopoly on the supply of marijuana that's legal for research. Now, obviously, they don't have a monopoly on the supply of marijuana in the United States, but if you want to do research to look at the benefits of marijuana, you have to get permission from NIDA to access their supplies. We have tried for about six years to get 10 grams of marijuana for a vaporizer research, for the volcano vaporizer to show how it, what's in the vapor stream as a way to try to say, is this something that can more likely make it through the FDA than smoking? And so we've been unable, we're the only people in America that can't buy 10 grams of marijuana <laughs> <laughs> after trying. And so far, the lab that we worked with has finally given up. They said it's bad for their business, they don't want to do it anymore. We recently, um, actually just a month ago, submitted a protocol to NIDA for a marijuana post-traumatic stress disorder study. And there are a lot of vets, there are a lot of people that do use marijuana for post-traumatic stress disorder. It helps them three, sleep through the night. There are some advantages. It's not a cure, it's more treatment of symptoms. Working with MDMA is more leading towards a cure. So it's not our top research priority, but it's primarily um, a protocol that we've submitted in order to try to demonstrate that the NIDA system is really fundamentally designed to obstruct research into developing marijuana into a medicine. And so we've just got back the first com communication from NIDA, and what they've told us is that we, this is a very well-designed study. We have tried for 10 years to break the monopoly. We have a big lawsuit against the DEA. We're trying to get our own um, source, <laughs> source of supply of, 
our own independent source of supply of marijuana. We have our own MDMA, our own LSD. There's private suppliers for all the different psychedelics. And that's why we're able to make progress. Uh, so this marijuana protocol has got five different groups. It would have a placebo marijuana, 2% marijuana, 2% uh, THC, 6% THC. And there's been, for the last 15 years, a lot of interest in cannabidiol, CBD, which has anti-anxiety properties. So we've asked for a supply of marijuana that has 6% THC and 6% TH CBD to compare against the THC. And then we've asked for a higher dose of 12% THC. Now, we've done a marijuana potency study of what marijuana is most often used at medical marijuana dispensaries around the country, and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 16%. They, people are now um, often advertising with their own analytical labs that they're up to 20%, sometimes THC. So what NIDA just told us is, forget about marijuana with CBD. They have actually none with CBD in it. And they have no 12% THC. Their highest is around 6%. And they're going to have to review our protocol. FDA will tell us in about 10 days uh, what they think about the protocol. NIDA will tell us probably in six months that they don't like it. And then if we decide to reply to their critiques, it'll take another six months or so. So this idea that there is this fundamental obstruction of medical marijuana research is, is totally true, and it's based on this government monopoly. So these are some of the political obstructions that have been put into play. And we're slowly overcoming them. With psychedelics, we've made an awful lot of progress with the research. And I think there's been probably, though, much greater social evolution, for sure there has been, from the illicit use of psychedelics. Most of us have had experiences in that way. Millions of people have. And I think it has caused a lot of change in attitudes. It's not inherently so, but I think it can be so. And I think trying to look at why it's important, um, back in um, 1983, I was an a undergraduate in college, um, and I had read this book by Robert Mueller. And Robert Mueller was, at the time, the Assistant Secretary General for the United Nations. He was like the, the mystic at the UN. And he basically was outlining in this book, it's called New Genesis, Shaping a Global Spirituality. His basic theory was that there are a lot of conflicts that are based on uh, nations against nation, and that that's why the United Nations was created, to try to resolve those. But that underneath these national conflicts are a lot of religious conflicts that animate a lot of the, the wars that are taking place, religious prejudices. And that what we need to move to a healthier world is a global spirituality. And he made an eloquent case that this was something that people were moving towards, the sense of um, unity, the sense of connection, that that would be really helpful. And so I, I decided that I would write him a letter. And I wrote him a letter, and I said, your book was terrific, it was very inspiring, but you didn't say a word about psychedelics. And psychedelics can be helpful in understanding spirituality, and they've been used for thousands of years for that purpose, but now research is blocked. Would you help try to start re the renewal of psychedelic research? And this was at the time when it was sort of completely blocked. This was 83. As I said, the changes at FDA took place 89-90. Rick Strassman started in 1990. So to my utter surprise, Robert Mueller wrote me back the Assistant Secretary General wrote me a handwritten letter, and he said, basically, um, you understood my book. I agree with your point, and here's a series of people who I think you should communicate with. And these were religious professionals, religious mystics from a bunch of different traditions. So the subtext was, send them MDMA. Because at the time, MDMA was legal, and I had mentioned to him that it in my letter that that was the case. So I started this uh, informal project of seating uh, various people, Roman Catholic monks inside the monastery, uh, Zen Buddhist leaders, the head of their traditions in their countries, Orthodox Jewish rabbis, and they were all willing to report back to Robert Mueller what they did. And one in particular, Brother David Steindelrost, who is a Roman Catholic mystic and monk, who has... He's in his 80s. We were just together in Moscow at a transpersonal psychology conference over the summer. 
uh, it's just astonishing how he's been able to both stay within the tradition and be so uh, mystically minded. But he tried MDMA in the monastery and uh, found it to be extremely helpful as a tool to deepen his meditation practice. And when we were finally faced with the DEA trying to criminalize MDMA, he was willing to speak to the press. So the first article was in Newsweek, and uh, Brother David uh, said that MDMA helps you to get to a place that you could spend 20 years trying to get to in meditation practice. I also worked with um, Rabbi Zalman Schachter, who is an Orthodox rabbi who had uh, actually taken LSD with Timothy Leary, who was um, part of this Jewish renewal movement. He was willing to speak to the press as well. He spoke to the Washington Post in 1985. He compared MDMA to the Sabbath. (laughs) So that what happened was that this kind of information feeding back to Robert Mueller, confirming this idea that psychedelics could play a role in people who were deeply embedded in their own specific religious traditions, and it could help them deepen their spiritual practices, and the fact that these people had a sense of social justice, that they were willing to speak to the media, also showed to me that that this kind of psychedelics and social change, it, it really can go together. And I worked with Robert Mueller. This is going to be a little bit hard to see. Uh, But we designed a a dream protocol. And this is something that I feel like um, I'm working towards. I spoke yesterday just about studies for the treatment of of post-traumatic stress disorder. But what this study is designed to do, and this may take another 20 years to do, maybe... um, I'll never get to do it. Somebody eventually will do this study. And so this is sort of the heart of, I think, um, psychedelics and social change. What this study basically says um, is that what we need to do is to try to work with people who are in training to be religious professionals in their own different traditions and just take them for like a two, three-year period. And we would take uh, maybe 30 people or, you know, it's arbitrary how many we would take, but we would assign half of them to go through their normal practice of training to be a religious professionals in their religion, and then the other half would be assigned to have their training supplemented by psychedelics. And we would do this in about three or four or five different religions simultaneously. And then at the end of the period of time, of this three or four year period of this training process, what we would do is a whole series of tests, and we would try to evaluate how each uh, person who was supplemented with psychedelics as a group, how they compared to the people that went through the training in a standard way. And that would be one of the analysis. Did they have a deepened meditation practice or whatever they did? Did they have a deepened sense of spirituality? You know, What kind of personality changes did they have? Then we would do a different kind of analysis, which would be, what kind of visions, what kind of imagery, what kind of um, psychedelic experiences, what was the content of their psychedelic experiences, and how did it compare to the imagery from within their own religion? Um, I've had psychedelic experiences that were um, surprisingly Christian in theme in some. I felt in one, I was describing it uh, earlier today, that it was an Ibogaine experience, and uh, I felt like I was being crucified on the cross of my own self-perfectionism. And it it turned out to be um, one of the most, it was actually a year after this uh, protocol was written, it turned out to be one of the most important experiences that I've had. Uh, But it was mediated in largely Christian imagery terms, which which was something that was a surprise to me. So then we would look at the kind of imagery that these people had and how did it compare to their own religions? And then the third analysis would be a comparative cross-religion analysis to see what were the common themes between the people from the different religions and how many of their images and how many of their processes were similar. And the goal would be to try to determine is there evidence for a sort of common mystical experience that's basically human? Is there this common mystical core Or is it that each people are like climbing different mountains? Or is it just different paths to the same mountain? 
And I think if we could do a study like this, that it would be a way to try to sort of bring science and religion together and also work on commonalities. And I think we would end up finding that there is more or less a common mystical core that all of us have access to. And we, we heard earlier today about the, um, the six uh, parts of the mystical experience, and I'm going to go over that also again. But what was important to notice in, in the earlier presentation was that the various categories were without specific religious imagery from any particular religion or culture. So that th those were, by Bill Richards, they were developed for the Good Friday experiment, which I'll talk about in a moment, but that there is um, at least some scientific evidence to suggest that there is a common mystical experience, a common spirituality that is something that's part of our human legacy. And that if we can experience that deep down, then it will more likely than not lead us to appreciate people from different cultures. We won't be as scared of people from different religions. It will be trying to take the fundamentalism that we see in so many different religious contexts and replace it with a, a really live, profoundly, personally, deeply felt experience that then leads one to be less rigid about the dogma. And I think that if that's something that we can bring more into the world, and I think we're all doing that in our different lives through our experiences, that there is a way in which we can end up really moving towards a more peaceful world. It's hard to articulate this kind of a, a theory, but I think it's what really animates me more than trying to help people who are dying with anxiety or trying to help people with post-traumatic stress disorder. It's really for moving towards trying to do a study of this sort. And I think there's an enormous amount of resistance that will be there from the religious traditions, from the fundamentalists, but that it's, I think, where we're moving towards this understanding of how we're in it together, it's one world, that we're not any more isolated, the kind of global communications, that if we really have from, you know, we talked about you know, billions of people and billions of more people coming. But if, if there is an anchor in a lot of people with this fundamental core that, that they are more similar to other people than they are different, then I think it will be more difficult for demagogues and dictators and others to mobilize through fear to create outside enemies and then to dehumanize them. I think that's the, the big vision. That's the hope. And we will get there in all sorts of different ways through psychedelic studies of a whole range of kinds. But I think the, the, the big payoff from integrating psychedelics is through this kind of global spirituality and then helping people who are inclined to do so accelerate the um, process of actually getting to those deep levels. I think that's what we're, we're hoping to, to really reach. And why is it necessary? According to um, Albert Einstein, it has become appallingly obvious that our technology has exceeded our humanity. And uh, I'm going to, this is just sort of in the way that I grew up as a young child and I, how I sort of learned, thought about these things. But the first was through Auschwitz. Um, he also said, the splitting of the atom has changed everything, save our mode of thinking. And thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. Now, this is of course what he's talking about. But what is this mode of thinking that he's talking I think that the mode of thinking that has to change is this, uh, again, sense of us as primarily American or primarily our country, primarily our race, primarily our gender, primarily our religion, primarily our social class. That when we, or primarily human as compared to the world as, uh, of nature as separate. That the mode of thinking, the shift that we need to take, and I don't think that the idea of ego death is all that, I, I think there's some problems with this concept of ego death, but I don't think, as long as we're humans, I don't think the ego will ever really die. There is really no, I, I think even wanting the ego to die is sort of denying our humanity, and I don't think it's healthy. 
what Stan Groff uh, has talked about is becoming transparent to the transcendent. That the ego becomes transparent, that it's becoming something that you can see through it. It assumes its rightful place, but it's never completely gone. So I think that the mode of thinking that Einstein is talking about, the shift that needs to take place is who we think we are and what is our place in the world and in the universe. And if we can make that shift, we will avoid situations like this. I was also, as I said, a draft resistor preparing to go to prison. That, that Vietnam was something that was um, a big a part of my childhood and my teen years, what to do about that. Um, <laughs> Now, I mentioned, this is from a, a movie um, called A Serious Man by the Coen brothers. I, don't, if, I highly recommend you see it. it it's probably especially uh, amusing to people that are Jewish. But uh, th there was a scene where, uh, right before this, he and a, a friend of his smoked pot in the bathroom. <laughs> so this is his effort to, to go through his bar mitzvah. My bar mitzvah really did not turn me into a man. And um, it, I thought it would. I, I really did. And I remember sitting in bed for um, a whole week, every night after my bar mitzvah, thinking it must have been a busy Saturday. <laughs> you know, God must be somewhere, you know, it's like Santa delivering all the presents or something. It must take a lot of time to get to me. And uh, I thought, uh, what this is basically saying is that our normal rites of passage in our culture don't really work for many of us. And I think that's part of the appeal of psychedelics is that the tradition, and, and I, I don't think that it's always been this way. Bar mitzvahs may really have worked in other time periods where people were more isolated, where it meant more to be able to read from the Torah and to, to assume adult responsibilities. But this was my, in the face of these conflicts that I was seeing in the world, what I was seeing was that I didn't have the tools, my culture was not providing me with the tools that would help me really to grow up and to answer the spiritual questions that I was struggling with even at 13. Now, I was fortunate to grow up at a time where um, LSD was much more popular. And this is a picture of uh, John and Yoko Ono and Timothy Leary um, during their bed-in for peace. So I was fortunate, in a way, to be living in this time of turmoil where I could at least initially, as I said yesterday, that I really thought the propaganda was true. I really thought that LSD made you permanently crazy, that there was something fundamentally destructive about it to your brain. So I wasn't at this time really ready for it, but, but it was in my awareness. And it was when I went to college and I was able to start um, taking LSD, I, um, I started college in 1971. I um, took a bunch of LSD, a bunch of mescaline, and um, I dropped out in 1972 <laughs> to try to work on this balance. I felt that both myself, that we are fundamentally overdeveloped intellectually and technologically and underdeveloped spiritually and emotionally. And that is where these quotes have been for. And I, I went to the guidance counselor at school, and I was so lucky that he gave me a manuscript copy of Stan Groff's Realms of the Human Unconscious. And I was able to start reading that. And, and one of the things that Stan wrote was that LSD is to the study of the mind, what the telescope is to astronomy, and the microscope is to biology. For me, Stan put it all together in that here was science looking at spirituality and also with the test of therapy. So it wasn't philosophy. There was outcomes. Like, was it really helpful to people? As long as that, that was sort of the grounded test. And it felt like I was waking up just as everything was being shut down. I thought I was going to go to jail. And I thought, what am I going to do for a career? I can't be a doctor, I can't be a lawyer, I can't be anything that requires a license. And I need to respond to Hitler, I need to respond to this kind of social insanity. I thought, I'm going to be a psychedelic therapist. That I will both need the therapy myself, and I will eventually, hopefully, be able to help other people through their own struggles. So this was the, the big vision, too. And I think this is really still the case, that, that psychedelics can reliably produce... Uh, mind manifestation. I mean, Freud talked a lot about dreams as the railroad to the unconscious. And I think psychedelics are very similar to that, that, that they will bring out what's inside. Now, when was the last time that in our culture, in a Western culture, that we actually had 
psychedelics integrated into the culture? How long has this sort of system of prohibition, in a way, been in place? And we have to go back to the Eleusinian Mysteries. They ran for 2,000 years, and they were the heart of their Greek culture. They, people um, were encouraged, at least once in their life, to have an initiatory experience. They were under pain of death. They could not talk about it, so we don't know exactly what happened. But they were um, a psychedelic ritual that, again, did this transparent to the transcendent. They put people's sense of who they were in a proper context. That's at least what we can understand what the Ellicinian Mysteries were about. There's been, um, this is by Albert Hoffman, um, a book about um, Hoffman's elixir. He ended up, and uh, Carl Ruck and Gordon Wasson, writing and trying to identify what was the preparation, the kikion, that people drank. And they made the, the thesis that it had ergot in it, which was pretty clear, and that it was likely to be a psychedelic compound. Now, the Eleusinian mysteries were shut down in 396 by the Roman Catholic Church. So it was like uh, a competition for spirituality. And the church wanted to be the intermediary between you and your own spirituality. Whereas with the Eleusinian mysteries, it was more a direct, democratic, personal connection. And so this was really, when we look back, the last time. So it's... Uh, you know, 1,600 years that, that our culture... So when we think about how difficult it will be to bring back psychedelics into an integrated part above board where it's linked with um, religious opportunities to, to experience in different contexts, we're really trying to come over um, a very long process. Now, there was also kind of a divide between science and religion that happened, um, you know, around 500 years ago. And again, it's this Copernican revolution that um, he wrote in 1542. He wrote that the year before he died, he published that on the revolutions of the celestial spheres. And then it was banned by the church in 1616. So this was where we're starting to get this idea of the scientific method, of the scientific process, and yet we're seeing the conflict with fundamentalism and the conflict with religion. Um, Father Bruno, who was one of the people that really followed up on what Copernicus had done, was uh, condemned for heresy. Uh, during his trial, he said, I never ought to recant, nor will I. And when he heard his sentence, which was a sentence of death to be burned by the stake, he said, in pronouncing my sentence, your fear is greater than mine in hearing it. The fear of the status quo towards change, towards the questioning of what they are claiming to believe in and where they draw their power from. Um, Galileo was uh, forced to recant, and in 1633, he was put under house arrest for the rest of his life. So there's been this process where science was kind of developed in a way that was separated from religion and separated from spirituality. A lot of a lot of that is actually good. I mean, there is a lot of bunk in religion and a lot of things where science was able, to, I think, to make a lot of progress. But what we see now is that we have had, you know, a science that is so disconnected from morality and from ethics. Um, there was, um, Tom Lear was a, a satirist in the United States. He, he wrote a lot of political songs. He talked about Werner von Braun, who developed the rockets for the Nazis, and one of his songs was about how Werner von Braun is saying, um, my job is just to make the rockets go up. Where they come down is not my department. <laughs> so I think there's been this sense that scientists are willing to create enormous uh, engines of destruction, and then it's not their responsibility what the politicians do with them. So this is also something that we are now trying to, to overcome, and we are in I think we're incredibly fortunate to live in the age that we are because we have now benefited from these centuries and millenniums of these kind of restrictions that we're overcoming. So that, um, this was Father Bruno. So 1962 was where I think science and religion really started coming together. And this was the Good Friday Experiment by Walter Pankey. And this was actually the best thing that Timothy Leary ever did in my view, is that he was the faculty sponsor for this study. And what it was, was a 20 subjects 
They were all training to be divinity students, to, to be ministers, and they went into church on Good Friday, and half of them got psilocybin and half got a placebo, and it was an active placebo of nicotinic acid. And they went through a four-hour service, and this was um, at Boston University in Marsh Chapel. This is where it took place. To, to give you a sense of how non-controversial things were at this time, in 1962, the minister was Reverend Howard Thurman, a dynamic black minister. He was Martin Luther King's mentor. Martin Luther King was getting a PhD at Boston University at the time. So we have the establishment saying, yes, you can bring a bunch of tripping people into church, and we want to see, as well as you do, what's actually going to take place. So this experiment was one of the most... Um, inspirational pieces of psychedelic research and many of the current psychedelic researchers who were involved trace a lot of their inspiration back to this study because what it did show is that roughly um, now, now what they said is this typology of mysticism that was created just for this experiment um, there was uh, 20 subjects as I said 9 out of the 20 had over a 60% uh, cut off on enough of the categories of mystical experience to be considered to have a mystical experience. And eight out of those nine had the psilocybin, one had the placebo. So that the claim was here that this experiment demonstrated in a scientific way that psilocybin in a religious context, in people that are religiously inclined, can facilitate a mystical experience. And that at the six-month follow-up that people reported that they had positive benefits in terms of their, uh, their attitudes towards death, their personalities, that they, they felt that it was beneficial to them. Now, this study was um, based on this kind of uh, questionnaire, and this was how they evaluated it. And, and you saw this earlier today. So the sense of unity, um, it's, this is a painting by Alex Gray. It's both either internal or external. So you can have a sense that you're connected with the world, the created world, or you're sort of the implicit or the explicit, or that you're connected to the sort of formless world. So it can be a unity without sort of deeper than substance, but it's the sense of connection, that we're all in it together. Um, there's a transcendence of time and space. There's something eternal about it. There's a sense of sacredness. I use this picture because, in a way, um, how wonderful it is, how much of a source of conflict, but how wonderful it is that within... Um, a couple hundred yards, you've got the place that's holy for the Christians, holy for the Jews, and holy for the Muslims. And if we can all just eventually get to the place where we can appreciate that it's the multiplicity of forms of different religions that really adds to the sacredness rather than they're all warring with each other. That's, I think, um, the potential. That's what we're hoping for. A sense of being in conjunction with uh, objective reality is kind of um, some kind of scientific measurements there to indicate that, and deeply felt positive mood and ineffability. This isn't this is an M.C. Escher painting. It's not quite you know that you can't communicate it in words, but kind of gives that idea. It goes beyond your concepts. So again, these are not linked to any particular Christian imagery, um, but in the mystical tradition, there's there's the experience itself. But the real test is called the fruits test. What has this experience done to people in their lives? Has it been beneficial? The idea is that if it's a genuine mystical experience, it has positive benefits for the people that experience it and that it will enrich and enliven their, their lives. So unfortunately, Walter Packey, who did the study, um, died at a scuba diving accident in uh, 1971. And so I'm convinced that he would have done this experiment if he had lived. But... As I was, um, I, I dropped out of school for 10 years. I went back in 1982 to college. And the college that I went to required a senior thesis. And I wanted to do something with psychedelics, with psychedelic research. And it was impossible at the time to get permission to actually administer psychedelics. Plus, I was just an undergraduate. I was, wasn't a doctor. I had no connections. But what I realized is to do a long-term follow-up to the Good Friday experiment would be better than doing any kind of new research because here it was now 
in the midst of the Reagan war on drugs, the expansion of the war on drugs, trying to, in the just say no era, uh, not, I, I think this just say, just say no in a different way is really a smart uh, play on the words, but that in the midst of that, what I decided to do is I would track these people down the best that I could and interview them and say, okay, you're now, you were going to be ministers, you've had this mystical experience, Perhaps you've had other non-drug mystical experiences through the benefit of the wisdom of aging and of time. What do you think now back on what happened? I went to the Andover Newton Theological Seminary where the experiment had taken place. And I said, would you be willing to, uh, because these names, who, who um, was in the study, it was all secret and hidden. I had no idea who was actually in the study. All I knew is that they had gone to Andover Newton in 1962. And so I went there, I said, would you put something in the alumni newsletter saying that I'm doing this study, so that if anybody was actually in the original study, they'd contact me. And they refused to do that. They were distancing themselves from this, one of the most important experiments ever in the history of uh, the scientific study of religion, done with their students, and they didn't want to know a thing about it. And so out of like frustration, I sort of went to their library, and I thought, I wonder if they even have a copy of Walter Pankey's thesis in there. And they didn't. They didn't even have a copy of it. And just through wandering around, I happened to stumble on um, the alumni uh, newsletter that listed um, everybody's names and addresses. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I photocopied that. And um, it was about eight years uh, out of date, but I just mailed to everybody. And eventually, I identified 19 out of the 20 people. It took me about four years. I traveled in person to interview 17 of them. And what I discovered in this long-term follow-up really anchored my decision to continue in my life's direction working towards psychedelics. And I also think I understood a little bit more about the struggles of the 60s because when we tend to think about what happened in the 60s and you have the, the image of the cultural revolution and the turmoil, a lot of the backlash people claim is due to people that had terrible experiences with psychedelics. They weren't prepared, they jumped out a window, they, they went, you know, the, the fear of parents about their children having uh, experiences that, that sort of tear them apart. That that was the idea of psychedelics gone wrong is what really triggered the backlash. And what I believe to be the case now is that it's psychedelics gone right that triggered the backlash. And by that I mean is that the people in this study told me this, that, that what I found was that it developed an enhanced appreciation of life and nature, it deepened their sense of joy, it deepened commitment to the Christian ministry or to whatever other vocations the subjects chose, it enhanced their appreciation of unusual experiences and emotions, it increased their tolerance of other religious systems, it deepened their equanimity in the face of difficult life crises. It reduced their fear of death. And greater solidarity and identification with foreign peoples, minorities, women, and nature. This was sort of a constant theme. And what was also shocking to me was that the people that were in the psilocybin group had a, an extremely vivid memory for at least some portion of their psilocybin experience. But the people in the placebo group, most of them, could barely remember what happened in the study. It wasn't something that was really that vivid. It's like if I were to ask you, what movie did you see 25 years ago, you know, and tell me about it, you know, it, it probably has faded over time. So that something about these experiences imprint really deeply in memory, and they have this emotional power that has lifelong consequences. And when you have this mystical sense of connection, it does reduce your fear of death. I think it makes you a little bit more willing to put yourself on the line to participate. It makes you value life more while you have it. And this, again, the fruits test, what I heard from these people in the study, and again, it's just a small sample. They were already sort of socially justice-minded in order to become ministers, but they told that it enhanced this process. So this led me to think that the, the fuel that helped in part with the anti-Vietnam War movement, with the environmental movement, with the women's rights movement, 
even to some extent with the civil rights movement, that there was a lot of this psychedelic spirituality taking place in an informal way, and it was inspiring people to get involved. And the time was so polarized, though, that it really ended up, uh, there was really not much of a way to, um, to do this. And that, that sort of turned into culture counterculture. And I think now here we are, you know, 40, 45 years later, and we're trying to get over this sort of culture counterculture divide. And I think that's the importance of trying to do the research with psychedelics. That's the importance of us. There is no more, with global warming, with, there is no more away. There is no more island. There are no more private little utopias that we can create or escape to. We are all in it together. And I think that's, in a way, one of the good messages of global warming and of other things, that people are going to understand how interconnected we are. And so, again, this links towards the initial study that I talked that I would like to do one day, which is people from all different religions trying to really understand, is there a common core? So um, this is now leading towards, so where are we with the psychedelic renaissance? Um, it took 44 years for there to be any attempt to replicate the Good Friday experiment. So this was, Bob Jesse was here uh, before. Um, he and uh, Bill Richards and Roland Griffiths did this psilocybin spirituality study. What was different about this is that they worked with people individually rather than in groups, before the Good Friday Experiment was a group, and also that they worked in a non-religious setting. They worked in a hospital room. And even still, they showed that psilocybin can occasion mystical type experiences having substantial and sustained personal meaning and spiritual significance. So that we've gotten over that backlash, the Good Friday Experiment in a sense, in an isolated way, has been replicated. We've been able to start research at Harvard with MDMA for cancer patients with anxiety. So we've buried the ghost of Timothy Leary to some extent. Um, also, we've been able to, LSD as the quintessential symbol of the 60s. We now have our Swiss LSD study, and it's uh, for people who are dying. Um, we just heard uh, last week that we're screening the 12th and final subject in this study, and this woman has advanced stage breast cancer. And the results are, um, we're not sure what the results are going to be, but at least we can say so far that we've been able to safely administer LSD in a therapeutic setting without anybody having a serious adverse event. Um, I described uh, yesterday the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD in all these different countries, and hopefully also in Australia. Um, there's these series of, uh, this was a paper recently published, the Archives of General Psychiatry is the top journal in the, world in psychiatry, and they were willing to publish the um, psilocybin study for end of life. I should say that we submitted our MDMA post-traumatic stress disorder study to the same journal, and we went through similar kind of problems with horrible reviewers whose job it was to you know, get us uh, kicked out. They did such a terrible job that one of the psychiatrists on the, that knew the general editor that I showed the reviews to wrote to the general editor of the archives and said it's an embarrassment to the archives, the low quality of the reviewers, and that psychedelic research is starting up and it should be taken seriously. And Charlie Grove had submitted his paper after we submitted our paper, and they decided to review his in a, a more unbiased manner. And so they ended up publishing that. Um, there's a study at Johns Hopkins now with cancer patients. There's an NYU study with cancer patients. There's a nicotine addiction study with psilocybin at Johns Hopkins, a ketamine study. This, unfortunately, has been shut down in Russia. Russia's got a heavy hand, but for a while, the only psychedelic psychotherapy research in the world was ketamine research with Yevgeny Krupitsky in Russia. And um, it's been really helpful with alcohol and heroin addiction. Is there a spelling there? Um, and um, also, we're doing an Ibogaine project in Mexico. So... There's efforts at psilocybin um, at NYU to start with alcoholism research. And there's a whole series of studies with psychedelics and neuroscience at the University of Zurich with top brain scans all over the place. This is a psilocybin study with fMRI in England. There's just an enormous... And ayahuasca has now been used in research with freeze-dried encapsulated ayahuasca. So you might say, how do you take ayahuasca and do studies with it? But you can standardize the dose... And they've been able to do this, and they're doing EEG mapping of what happens with people's brains under ayahuasca. This is in Barcelona. So there's research all over the place. But what somehow what 
threatens the research, this sort of move towards expanding the psychedelic research and then eventually also the spirituality studies, is in some ways the, the non-medical use of psychedelics. And so what MAPS has done is we have picked the symbolically the kind of big festivals where there's uh, lots of use of psychedelics, Burning Man being one of them, the other being Boom in, in Portugal. So this is now, and I was interested to hear uh, the discussion that Alex had about uh, Portugal, and to tell you that um, these are the, the festivals where we have set up what we call the psychedelic emergency services. And what we're trying to show is that in a post-prohibition world, that there will be loads of people still experimenting with psychedelics, and there will be loads of people still getting into trouble. Because having a, um, this sort of mind manifest manifesting experience, a lot of stuff is going to happen that's difficult for people to integrate, difficult for people to handle, particularly if people are taking it only for a party. And if they're sort of seeing that the, the um, deeper issues, they either want to run from initially, they're not opening to them, they don't understand how to work with them. So what we've been able to do is... Uh, set up the psychedelic emergency services and to show that, that it's possible with a therapeutic approach to take people who have sort of inadvertently stumbled into deep psychological issues and by offering them support that we're able to really help reduce a lot of the problems. And the, the Boom Festival, because it's in Portugal with drugs are decriminalized, it's the world's example. So if you can imagine this, there is um, thin layer chromatography done on site. So all the drugs that are being sold at the festival are analyzed right there. And there's no police objections to it. And in fact, the people that are analyze it, analyzing it create a PowerPoint presentation, which they then broadcast with a slideshow on the side of their tent so that all the people at the festival, you just wander by and you just can see what something was supposed to be and what it is. It's just amazing. And it was really helpful to, to the therapist, too, because sometimes people would say, I took this pill, I don't know what's in it, I, you know, and then by looking at the, the list of what had been analyzed, we would know what was in it. They, um, the organizers of this festival, this is the chill-out space. This is specifically for people who have been tripping, who need a place to rest. They've created, um, they spent 30,000 euros just on a therapy team of about uh, 30 people to work 24 hours a day for the whole festival to, to work with people that came in. And they did it out in the open in a way to um, really educate everybody. So it's like if you go to a festival and you know that there's a medical tent, you're not so worried about hurting yourself. If you know that there's a psychedelic emergency services, people can sort of relax about their psychedelic use. Um, what I want to explain now is just the principles of psychedelic harm reduction to try to uh, explain how it is that people who... Uh, you don't know the patient, the person, the visitor. The, the first part is that you create a safe space. And the way in which you do that, it can be anywhere, but the, the sense is that whoever is going to be um, sitting for the people that come, you need to sort of say to them in a way, I'm going to be here for as long as it takes, that you have a stable interpersonal relationship. It could last for 12 hours. It could last for days. People sometimes come to the boom space or the sanctuary space at Burning Man and, and stay for days. But you create a safe space. And what that also means is that people are non, they're not judged. It's a non-judgmental stage where you can let people feel free that they can let out their emotions, whatever they happen to be, that you will protect them, but that you will um, also, in some ways, really support them in their process. So it's more than just you know, the drug's going to last another six hours, you're going to come down, don't worry about it. It's more what's bothering you. It's more psychedelic therapy, brief intervention. But the safe place, the, the safe container is really the critical first step. Then the understanding is that you're sitting, not guiding. And what that means is that, again, the inner unconscious, the unconscious is the guide. The person is their own therapist in a way. And you're trying to help them navigate this material that's coming up. But you don't necessarily know what they need to do, what they need to think about, you know, what will be the, the key that heals them. But your goal is to be there with them. And this doesn't mean that you're sort of neutral, but it does mean that you can be inquiring, you can ask provocative questions, but then you kind of let go and see how they respond. 
And you can help them by just, a lot of times people will say, like drop a word, like my, you know, my mother died, and, and then they go on and on. But you know that that's an emotionally charged thing for them. And so by asking them about it, it kind of gives them permission. It tells them that you're willing to go there into that depth of emotions with them. So you can, it's not like you know where they need to go, though. That, that's the, the key switch from sort of traditional psychoanalysis, where the, the therapist, the psychiatrist sort of gives you the interpretation. And this also makes it so that you can understand some way to work with people that you've never met before. You don't have a history. They're just in a crisis right then. Um, this is, I think, even more of a key point, which is that you talk through, not talk down. So that you help people to work directly with whatever issues that they're presented. That you suggest that they look at this or they look at that. That, that your goal is not to turn them away and say, here's some beautiful flowers, you know, the life can be beautiful. But it's to really say, you know, what is it that's bothering you? So you talk them through it. You don't try to take them away from it. And then the, the core principle is that difficult is not the same as bad. Most people have this idea, I'm out for a party, I'm taking psychedelics, and then it gets tricky, that means it's bad, that means you're off track. And so by telling people that difficult is not the same as bad, this can be difficult, you can learn sometimes more from things that are difficult from that are things that are easy. And so this is kind of how we um, work, and this is, in a way, how we're trying to prepare the culture. We've been able to develop a curriculum for uh, high school and college students that includes... Um, we've had to frame it as how do you help a friend of yours if they're having a difficult experience? And what we found is that by framing it in that way, we're actually teaching how to trip, how, how to trip in a productive therapeutic way. But it's all, again, in this harm reduction, helping a friend of yours. But that's a way in which it gets past a lot of the resistances and we're able to try to build in some ways um, more of a cultural understanding of how to work with psychedelics. Now, um, the reason I'm uh, showing you this is that we are able, through our research, to affect the culture and the cultural understanding of psychedelics in a lot of different ways. And it's reaching this wonderful space now where Elle magazine, a very popular magazine for women, um, this was the current issue. In a couple months, they're going to have an article on MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. So that it's really the mothers, the parents who are worried about their kids, I think, that is still the driving force behind the drug war. It's the fear, I think, of parents for their children that's sort of at the bottom anchor of how politicians are able to really generate fear. And so by trying to come across two parents, two women, in a different way, if you look at the history of prohibition, the Women's Christian Temperance Union was involved in helping to create prohibition. It was very much linked with the women's suffrage movement because the, the thought was that women, in order to try to protect their children, would vote for prohibition. So women's voting rights and prohibition were intimately linked in the early days of the, the, 19th, the 20th century. And it was women's groups that ended up being the ones that really helped end prohibition by seeing that their kids were sort of succumbing to the allure of the speakeasies, the lure of the easy money, the whole gangster phenomena, that I think we will see the end of global prohibition when we start seeing the rise of parents' movements that are not just saying, let's make the war on drugs harder. So this is a key part. But even more than this is Oprah. <laughs> So the, the slides that I showed you yesterday from, um, of the holes in the brain were shown on Oprah's TV show in uh, 2001. So in the March issue of O Magazine, which is her own magazine, there's going to be another article on MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder. So in terms of this social cultural change, really we're starting to come in the ways that I think people can hear it from unlikely sources and what this story is going to be about is both our work with PTSD, with MDMA, but also this story of Mara and Marilyn Howell. And this is the work with MDMA to help people who are dying. Um, Mara's died at age 33 of cancer. Marilyn was her mother. Um, Marilyn and um, 
wanted her daughter to be in the study at Harvard with cancer patients. The study wasn't ready to enroll her at the time, and so she worked with an underground psychedelic therapist. Marilyn was the um, co-therapist, and there was a whole series of uh, psychedelic experiences for the last uh, about five months of Mara's life, uh, two MDMA sessions, a psilocybin mushroom session, an LSD-MDMA combination session, uh, and then an MDMA session that was um, three days before Mara died, and then she died under the influence of MDMA while her mother was reading her uh, this book from Laura Huxley, this timeless moment that was about the death of Aldous Huxley, and Aldous asked to be administered LSD as he was dying. So this kind of a story coming to people through Oprah magazine I think is just um, a way in which it's another sign that this cultural change, there's a hunger for healing that we're able to respond to. So <laughs> to get back to uh, what your own government is doing, this is <laughs> the, uh, the image that, this is not the Maryland, you know, this is not this image of helping, mother helping your daughter to die in a, in a more spiritual, peaceful way. But this is supposedly facing facts, looking at this, insomnia, memory loss, or psychological problems. This is the, um, the face of fear. Uh, in terms of memory loss, uh, this is in press. There's a study in press in the journal Addiction that is NIDA funded. We, MAP started it. It was our, one of our best examples of leveraging money. We spent $15,000. It turned out that from a scientific point of view, looking at cognitive consequences of heavy ecstasy use, it's very difficult because the people that are using ecstasy are often using a lot of other drugs as well. Marijuana, alcohol, other things, and, and they're dancing all night. How do you tell what the MDMA is or what the ecstasy is? Because even the ecstasy is not always MDMA. But how do you separate it apart? And it's a problem with scientific research. And we were um, fortunate enough to have one MAPS member write to us and say, I've got the solution to this methodological problem. There's a bunch of people that have done only ecstasy and no other drugs. And we're like, how could this possibly be? Um, and then it turned out that the guy was writing to us from Utah. And for those of you who don't know, Utah is the home of the Mormons. And the Mormons are against alcohol, against tobacco, against all sorts of things. So there's a bunch of like fallen Mormon kids <laughs> that sort of went for ecstasy. And it turned out we did a $15,000 pilot study. And they exist, this population existed. And at the time, NIDA was sort of disappointed because their fear campaign based on uh, MDMA hurting dopamine, which was uh, in Science Magazine, had to be withdrawn. The paper it was, uh, a tra it was one of the worst examples of uh, scientific error. The study was retracted because they gave methamphetamine instead of MDMA to these animals. <laughs> and they, they did, the bottles got somehow or other switched. Um, so they had to retract the whole study. So NIDA was sort of hungry for what's bad with MDMA. And we're hungry for what's the real facts about MDMA. And so we were willing to do and encourage and did this study, on uh, this pilot study on MDMA in this population. And then the doctor, uh, John Helpern, submitted it to NIDA, got a $1.8 million five-year grant. So it's just coming out. Um, in a study designed to minimize limitations found in many prior investigations, we failed to demonstrate marked residual cognitive effects in ecstasy users. This finding contrasts with many previous findings, including our own, and emphasizes the need for continued caution in interpreting field studies of cognitive function in illicit ecstasy users. This will be coming out fairly soon. Fairly soon. So this will be, I think, the face that we would like people to think about in terms of MDMA. This is um, a woman veteran. We're enrolling women veterans. And this is just so much different than this face. <laughs> this is what we're hoping to, to sort of communicate. And this is the last slide. And this is, this is uh, from the UNESCO. I like to um, wander around cities at night. Um, I get a much better feel for them. Um, you know, there's not as many people there. Sometimes I'll smoke pot and just go wandering around. And, um, one time I was wandering around Washington, D.C., and I ended up not so far from the Supreme Court building, um, about three or four in the morning, and it was the Veterans for Foreign Wars. And it had this um, big uh, sort of obelisk, uh, triangular obelisk that went up uh, several stories. And it had these panels 
of uh, all the different wars that Americans have been in. You know, and it was, I was just like, gosh, you know, all these wars, glorifying war, war, war. And then I turned the corner around one of the, the panels that was behind, and this quote was at the base of that obelisk. Since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. And I saw even the veterans of foreign wars is sort of pointing this way. And this is what I hope is the future of psychedelics, uh, cultural change, and social evolution. Thank you. Why hasn't there been a successful challenge under the American Constitution based on religious freedom, given the overwhelming nature, spiritual religious nature of these compounds? Well, okay, first off, there has been some successful challenges. Uh, you know, there's half a million people in the Native American church that have legal permission to use peyote. But again, the, the, the Supreme Court said that people have to be 25% Indian blood or, or more. So it's the first time that we have a religion based on race, which is, of course, outrageous. All right, secondly, the Uñao de Vegetal, the ayahuasca church in the United States, they took a case up to the Supreme Court to argue religious freedom, and they won their case unanimously. Now, I think the problem is that the problem of religious freedom, in a sense, is that you have to be part of a religion. You, you know, we want, I think, I, want, I don't want to have to say that I can only get it from my rabbi or something. You know, or I want to be, we, I think it's the deepest thing is that we each have our own direct line to spirituality. And we have to try to protect that. So that's even harder. That will require drug legalization because there is no personal spiritual freedom in the Constitution. It's religious freedom. It's freedom in groups. And also you have to show, the, the, the law is stacked against it, so you can't win. You have to really show that the drug is integral to the religion, that it's absolutely essential, that there's no religion without the drug. So people have tried... Uh, and a lot of times it's been the wrong people. You, you know, when you do a test case, you have to have really the ideal case. So you get a bunch of Jamaican Rastafarian drug smugglers who get busted and claim, oh, this is my religion. You know, so there's a lot of bad religious uh, law precedent against the drug smugglers who try to use it. Um, so I think that, that, that really it's, it's too... Religious freedom, personal spiritual freedom is too much individual, it, too much uh, drug legalization. It, it, and you have to have ways to treat, to teach the young, ways to train the, you know, you really have to be a religion. And re the psychedelics have to be the, um, the core of it. And so I think also that law is uh, evolving over time, that, that uh, I just don't think that the cases are ready for it. I mean, there, the American Civil Liberties Union has a whole section of lawyers just devoted to working on the drug war. You know, and, and they've basically... Uh, taken, they've helped a bit with uh, uh, Santo Daime, has also got a legal case. And they've won their case at the Ninth Circuit. Um, so that there are some small victories, but they're for the very tightly uh, defined religious groups. And it's, it's not going to affect the bulk of the people. Uh, just uh, on that topic, what if there was like the, uh, the Church of Psychedelia? <laughs> well, um, again, there's this... Um, it's, so you just start this Church of Psychedelia. You know, I mean, Leary tried that, you know, and it didn't work for him. So that it's a kind of thing where um, I really think science and medicine is more likely to be the way to change the culture. That, that there are people that have tried a DMT church in uh, New York. DPT. DPT, that's right. Yeah, DPT church. Yeah. And so, it, you know, again, it's like they've been able to get away with it, too, for a while. You know, and so... The DEA has limited resources. The police have limited resources. So they're going to try to go after what they think are the high-priority cases and the ones where they can mostly get the larger dealers. So they're not actually like on the prowl for underground psychedelic therapists or people who are using psychedelics in a religious way. Although they did target the Grateful Dead tours. And they had a whole... There's, there was the, at one point, there were several thousand people who were in jail for LSD from the Grateful Dead tours. So that the DEA did see that as kind of a feeding ground for the prison system. But 
in order to develop a new religion, the Church of Psychedelia, it would be um, a difficult case to make. People could try it. I mean, I think it's like um, to bring down the elephant. You know, you, you come at it from all these different directions. And there's, I think, more the idea of cognitive liberty. I think rather than religious freedom is to say that we have the freedom of the press, we have the freedom of assembly, we have freedom of speech, but underlying all of that is the freedom of thought that's sort of implied by the Bill of Rights. And that freedom of thought requires us to be able to access the full range of consciousness. So th there's actually lawyers who are trying to make that case. One of them, Richard Boyer, um, we were together at the um, Sentencing Commission when they were trying to figure out the penalties for MDMA. And, he, you know, and so it's like these are important um, arguments to make. They won't win, but they change people's thinking. My, my wife was um, a lobbyist for the Quakers in Washington, D.C., and she said that they never won a single thing, but they at least could say the military budget is too big, and at least it got some kind of people thinking. So I think it, it, it could possibly be a good thing to try to start Church of Psychedelia and get people, but I don't think um, it would do much practically. To bring down the elephant, give it 300 milligrams of LSD. <laughs> well, do you know that story, though? Do you know yes. the, but, but that wasn't the LSD. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, they, they claim that, yeah, an elephant died from LSD. Well, it turned out that the uh, elephant fell down, and then the, they were worried about it. And they gave, yeah, the tranquilizers. They over-tranquilized the elephant. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. we'll, uh, we'll have to call it, uh, call it quits, but um, please join me in thanking Rick again for... Uh, <laughs>